Um, I've been in Harvard for 32 years, and I always I learned about RSA since then. But I always like to meet one of the author. I never had a chance until uh, Harry said that he knows uh, Ron, and there should be no problem to get him to come. So I'm very glad that he will come. But in any case, I do not know the personal stuff about Ron as much as uh, Harry. So I will ask Harry to make a more in-depth introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Yao. Uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to come back to Harvard uh, to join this uh, uh, lecture series. Uh, uh, it's great to have uh, uh, Professor Ron Rivest of MIT to uh, give this lecture. Uh, I, I have uh, known Ron for a long, long time, uh, first as a, a graduate student reading his very thick book. Uh, so if you have not read, have not read you know, his uh, algorithm book, uh, you just have to. And it doesn't matter which discipline you are in, it's a wonderful algorithm book. Anything you need to know is in the book. Uh, I had the great pleasure to meet Ron uh, finally in person in 2005 uh, when he came to visit my research lab, uh, Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing. That's uh, how we got to know each other. Uh, apparently, you know, we uh, uh, liked each other, so Ron actually offered uh, us a couple of uh, Red Sox tickets. And uh, when my son and I came here, uh, so we really had a great time, and uh, uh, so my son was so inspired by that, and uh, so he eventually applied to uh, MIT and uh, very luckily got accepted there. So when he, in his uh, 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 sophomore year, he wanted to take Ron's advanced algorithm class, so, but he didn't have the prerequisites. So, uh, of course, you can always talk to the professor and uh, try to get that, so he did. So he went to Ron's office and uh, tried very hard, but failed. And just as he was walking out of his office, and Ron said, no, wait a second, so your last name is Shen? He said, yes. So your dad is Harry? He said, yes. So at that time, he he's had this new hope again. Then Ron, Ron smiled and said, say hi to your dad, but you still cannot take my class. <laughs> So all the stories aside, today you know, we, are, we are going to have this very exciting lecture by Ron. And is, um, I actually first time heard about electronic voting was from Ron in 2005. And uh, apparently uh, the, the year 2000 election inspired a lot of people to get into this field. But Ron actually started the, this line of research even in the 1980s. He's going to tell us a lot more uh, without further ado. Yeah, Professor Ron Rivest. Thank you, Harry, Professor Yao, for that introduction. And thank you uh, to all of you for the invitation to come here. It's a pleasure to, to come to, to Harvard. I get to Harvard maybe two, three times a year to, to visit uh, colleagues here. And, and it's a wonderful just down the road. So um, I'd like to talk about elections and some of the issues that I think about in terms of elections. And uh, I see Eric is here who gave the doing some lecture last year about voting. And this will also be about voting, but somewhat complementary issues not about best voting systems, but about security issues. My background is security, and so I'd like to think about you know, how would one try to hack a voting system, uh, and try to, how would you prevent trying to hack a voting system? And so that's, that's the origin of this. So I think we have some slides here. I have uh, too many slides, so I'll make this brisk, and feel free, but feel free to ask questions along the, the way. So the outline. Uh, so as I said, I like to think about voting as a security problem. So when you talk about security problems, the first thing I tell my students is you know, have to think about what the requirements are. What do you want not to happen when you're running an election? And so we'll talk about evidence-based elections. Talk about paper ballots and the importance of paper ballots, the auditing of paper ballots, uh, and a couple of uh, techniques that I've developed and worked on to try to make the auditing of paper ballots work better and more flexibly, uh, K-cuts and, and uh, Bayesian audits. And then uh, talk a little bit about cryptographic voting schemes, which I think are a bit in the future, but I, I think are quite promising. And then I always get asked about internet voting, so we'll have to finish with that, a little discussion of internet voting, which you know, I, I don't really like. <laughs> uh, so I'm not talking about Russians, <laughs> fake news, gerrymandering. These are all wonderful topics. Voter ID and the best voting rule, which was talked about last time. So I refer you to the lecture from last year if you want to hear about the best voting rule, the majority, majority rule. Wonderful lecture. That was. So 
2000, as Harry said, my interest in elections got started strongly in the year 2000 when we had the Bush-Gore election, hanging chads. Here's the classic picture of Judge Rosen, Rosenberg looking at a, a paper ballot with a punch holes trying to figure out is that a dimple chad or what. Um, we discovered that our election system was not up to snuff. Uh, it's still not up to snuff entirely, but we're getting better. Uh, and there's a nice report that came out in 2015 called Voting Machines at Risk, talking about some of the problems that we still have. And that's a, a good report to, to read to get your teeth cut on it. Uh, but you know, the question is, for any election, who really won? We take the 2016 election. There's lots of issues about the 2016 election, like whether the candidates should have been those candidates, and you know, whether the Russians meddled, and what, or to what extent they meddled, and so on too. But the question I'm focusing on is the tabulation accuracy. You know, did, did, was the vote counting tampered with, or was it accurate, or not historical so much as prospective? You know, how, do you, how do you run an election in a way that you can trust the outcome, trust that the vote counting was done right? So how do we vote now? Let's start off with that. Voting in the US is a complicated proposition. It's mostly paper ballots, which is good. Uh, people are sometimes very surprised that I come from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and they think that somehow paper is not a technology. Paper is the right technology for voting, in my opinion. It's a wonderful technology. It's very simple. And security is best based on simple technology. This is one of the first ver paper ballots. You can see uh, it's got some totals on it, but it's just what you had. It was introduced in the 1890s, called the Australian ballot. It was first used in Australia. Um, it was viewed at the time as a voter suppression technique because you had to be literate in order to use it. If you couldn't read the candidates' names, you couldn't use it, as opposed to being just given a colored piece of paper that you deposited in the ballot box. So it was uh, controversial at the time, but it's now, and since then, been the mainstay of our voting uh, technology. Did I, my battery die here or something? There we go. So here's the landscape of voting methods used in the United States now. As you can see, it's a mess in the sense that every county typically has the option of deciding on its own what kind of technology to use. The tan areas are voting by hand-marked paper ballots. The gray areas, which are good, the gray areas are, are direct recording by electronic, as they're called, DREs, which are bad. They have no paper trail at all. Uh, and the other things are, are mixed. The green areas are vote by mail. So Washington, Oregon, Colorado are vote by mail. Um, and some states have, have a variety of choices as to, as to what happens. Uh, Massachusetts is mostly uh, hand-marked paper ballots, but there's some, some uh, hand count, whether hand-counted or counted by machine. So, so it's, it's a complicated landscape, and so the Security techniques uh, may vary depending on what you've got, and that makes one, some of the problems quite technically interesting. So about 79% of the voters in the country, and this is a couple of years ago now, so it's gone up, uh, are using hand-marked paper, or using paper ballots, 55% of them hand-marked paper ballots. Some of them are mixed, some of them mixed. VVPAT means voter verified paper audit trail. So machines that you use a touch screen for, but they print out a paper ballot you can look at. So 80% of, of voters use paper, have an opportunity to check that their paper ballot accurately captures their intent. Uh, so that, that is a good thing, right? So you have a, something you can directly, directly check the ballot of record, which is the paper ballot. So the foundation of security, as we see, is going to be these paper ballots. Nonetheless, counting paper ballots by hand can be a pain. And so we typically use optical scanners, as we do here in Massachusetts, to count them efficiently. So here's a picture of a typical optical scanner. You've probably seen them if you voted in Massachusetts. You mark the ballot by hand. There's all these timing marks on the side of the ballot to tell the machine where the ovals are. It checks to see that the ovals are filled in properly. It tabulates the ballots it's seen according to um, the rules it's been programmed to, to have. And so it, it does an efficient job. It's much better than counting by hand, but it's a machine, and machines are fragile and attackable, and so we have questions about, is this, these, are these machines doing the right thing? They could introduce not only random errors, but systematic errors of various sorts that could greatly bias the outcome of an election. For example, there are voter intent rules in most states that say how you should interpret crazy things that voters do. A voter might 
take a ballot and not put any ink whatsoever inside the oval, but draw a circle around the oval. And if you look at that ballot by hand, you say, oh, that's what they intended, but it doesn't, the machines don't count that properly. And that's not uncommon. Or they might fill in an oval for a candidate name, and then where it says write-in vote, they'll put the same name down again, sort of an emphasis vote, but that the machines will say that's illegal, uh, whereas a, hand, a person like that by hand says, yeah, they just voted that, that candidate twice. There may be stray marks, you may have folding by vote by mail, you may configure the scanner wrong, uh, it's possible to have the tables saying which bubbles correspond to which candidates incorrectly filled out on the scanner. Uh, various other programming errors. And of course, these machines are being computers can be hacked in various ways and, and their programming can be totally uh, turned topsy-turvy to give you some sort of adversarially desired result. Maybe the adversary says, you know, skip the first 100 ballots and then change every 19th ballot to be Republican or something like that, or Democrat. So these scanners are, they're good for efficiency. They're not particularly good for being trustworthy. So how should we vote? Well, I think we're off to a good start. Let's look at the security requirements of voting. So they're not too complicated. Only eligible voters may vote. Well, the machines don't enforce that. That's typically a gatekeeper there who checks off your name on a list. Each eligible voter votes at most once. Again, the gatekeeper enforces that. Each cast vote is secret, so nobody should know how you voted. Even if you want them to know how you voted, you can't sell your vote. Right? So you don't get a receipt and you can't sell your vote. This is one of the things that makes voting much, much harder than your typical security application like banking or something like that where uh, you have nice transaction records. Voting, you cannot keep a record as to how in any particular voter voted. You have to make it anonymous and once you cut that tie, it becomes possible to hack uh, the pile of collected votes. So it, the, the secret ballot is, is one of the tough security requirements. The final outcome should be verifiably correct we don't want to just say it's right because the computer says so. You want to say it's right because you've got some process that gives you confidence that the right outcome is there. So some verification things. And there's no trusted parties that you can have that will give you a pro that can control a process in a trustworthy manner. You'd like it to be the case that any party is obligated to prove their trustworthiness. The election officials have to show that they're doing the right thing. The machines have to show that they're doing the right thing. The whole process has to be observable in a way that anybody could be a thing. quick question. What about having people in the voting group with you, which typically happens quite frequently? Yeah, so there's, there's various rules um, about coercion. You should not have somebody in the booth with you, although sometimes people bring their kids to show them what it means to vote. Yeah, and you shouldn't be able to take pictures of your ballot either in the voting booth because then you can sell your vote. That's the, re the receipt issue. So there's lots of these procedural things that have to be enforced at the polling place or should be enforced at the polling place. Unfortunately, some judges have said it's okay to take selfies with your ballot at the, at the, in the polling place too. So yeah, got a long ways to go on some of these points. So here's a very important point about elections. If, this, if there's one... Um, thing you take away from this talk, this, this slide is maybe the, the most important one. The election should not only accurately tell you who won, of course it should do that, it should count the votes accurately and tell you who won, but it should do that in a, in a way that's transparent and believable. It should produce convincing evidence that the winner won, right? And so people get confused sometimes. They, I, I talk to technologists all the time saying, let's throw a lot of money at this. I can design a computer system that can count votes accurately. Sure you can. And, it'll can, and you'll know that it's counting them accurately because you designed it and maybe you built it. But how does anybody else going to know that the, that machine is counting accurately? What's the evidence that the outcome is correct? Right? So you yourself are not going to be trusted um, just because you produced the machine and maybe you've got a technology background. right? So the machine should not only count accurately, it should demonstrably be counting accurately. And that's a very different proposition. And people often get confused on that. They talk about internet voting, things like that. The internet and computers are great at doing lots of things quickly and efficiently and maybe even accurately, but to make it demonstrably accurately, that's a very different thing, right? So you want to have verification that's built into the process. We want our democracy to be founded on you know, elections that are verifiably correct. So that's very, very important. So one of the principles is software independence, software isn't to be trusted. I love this cartoon, right? Here's a couple of voters who have just voted on some touchscreen machine where the ballot of record is some bit stored in the random access memory of this machine behind them. 
And the pollster is saying, and who do you hope you voted for? Right? You know, the ballot of record is not something the voter can verify directly on such a, such a design. Right? They may, the machine may have made them feel cozy and warm and comfortable and had a glitzing display, but you know, they don't know that the ballot that's actually going to be tabulated in the end is what they intended and what they wanted it to be. That's why paper ballots are really important. So software is not to be trusted, and people sometimes find it surprising that I'm a computer scientist and I say these things, but if you've programmed computers, you know how fragile programming it is and how often errors arise. So if a voting system is said to be software independent, if an undetected error in the software, or even and that could be malicious or not, an undetected error in the software cannot cause an undetectable change in the election outcome. It doesn't mean you're detecting it, but it's not undetectable. It doesn't erase its tracks. So strongly software independent is possible if it's possible to correct any such outcome error. And paper ballots provide such software independence. You can tell after the tabulation if something was counted wrong because you can go back to the paper ballots and you can recount them. You've got evidence as to what the correct outcome is in the form of those paper ballots. So evidence-based election, software independence go together. So I was on a committee that recently uh, wrote a report uh, called Securing the Vote. It's a National Academies panel, and I'm going to talk through this talk about some of the recommendations we made there, which follow on the themes that I've already mentioned. Uh, this is a downloadable thing. It came out last September. And there were 41 different recommendations made, and I'd like to lead you through some of them, which, um, as I said, follow with what I've said. So recommendation 4.1.2, use voter verifiable paper ballots everywhere by 2020. So as you can see, we're getting closer to that. It's over 80%. Uh, but we'd like to get that all the way up to 100%. Everybody should be using voter verifiable paper ballots. There are issues with disabled voters, perhaps, and you need special accommodations for them. But aside from, from voters with those such situations, you know, everybody should be looking at a voter verifiable paper ballot. And by 20, we're getting there. Some states are moving towards it, Georgia and, and uh, parts of Pennsylvania and so on too, are switching over to, to uh, voter verified paper ballots. So that's an easy one to say. Some people are surprised at this. I gave a lecture at a, a judge's conference recently about all of this, and many of the judges were surprised. Why don't you just use the computers? What is this about paper ballots? You know, and so they, they were wondering. But the paper ballots are, are you know, if you work with security all the time, you know that the, the, the principle is what? Keep it simple, stupid, kiss, right? Paper ballots are so simple and nice. They have lots of nice properties. Audit election outcomes. So not only is the paper there to provide a immutable record as to what, how the voter voted, but you could audit these paper ballots afterwards to see if the counting was done properly. So the most commonly proposed flavor of audit, there's many different flavors, uh, is the risk limiting audit developed by Philip Stark at Berkeley, um, called an RLA, it uses manual interpretation. So you look at the ballots by hand, you sample them randomly, you look at them by hand, and you try to verify with high statistical confidence and then you've got the outcome that uh, was reported earlier, right? And so if not, you may have to expand the sample, as we'll see, to, to look at a larger sample. So a risk limiting audit tries to minimize the risk of certifying the wrong election outcome. Just yesterday, the Washington Post came out with a nice op-ed piece editorial in support of risk limiting audits. So this is a hot topic. Uh, the Washington Post says we should be doing this everywhere. We should have federal legislation doing this. A simple step every state should take to safeguard elections. They're talking about risk limiting audits here, if you read the, the op-ed. So that came out yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, 7.31 PM, it says right there. So, so what is, what's the process for voting? So you print the ballots. If we're using paper ballots, you set, set up the election. The voter comes in, marks their choices on the ballots, verifies the ballot, makes sure that it's uh, what they intend. You should look at the ballot. Uh, if the ballot is a ballot marking device, sometimes the ballots are printed out by a machine. You use a touch screen first and print it out. Then you really do have to look at the ballot uh, to make sure. Then the optical scanners look at the paper ballots, give the initial or reported outcome. These are then um, tabu these are tabulated by the scanners or by some collection of scanners. And then we want to have a statistical audit of these paper ballots. You'd like to know that those scanners did the right thing. So you look at a sample, a random sample of them by hand to confirm that you've got the right outcome. This is how we develop confidence in the reported outcome. I wonder if the battery's fading on this thing. There we go. This is a wonderful quote by Porvi Vor, who's a professor of computer science at George Washington University. Brush your teeth, eat your spinach, audit your elections. <laughs> right? 
think it's the right attitude. So how do we audit paper ballots? What's the process you would use? Well, there's two key parts. There's the sampling part. We're going to do a statistical audits. So you're going to draw some random sample of the paper ballots. And then there's figuring out what that sample means. How do, how do you compute some measure of the confidence you've got, the p-value or some other measure that uh, corresponds to what that sample is telling you about the election? So for the sampling part, there's a couple of parts. I'll give you a, a demonstration of a, a, a new technique we're doing that. How do you pick a random ballot out of a box of paper ballots? Right, it seems like you could number of ways you could do that. So we've got to develop some techniques for, for that. There's one called K-cut that seems to be becoming popular. Figuring out what the sample ballots tell you about the reported outcome. There's risk limiting audits. And there's another flavor of audit called Bayesian audits that I'll explain to you as well. So just again, what's the audit for? Who's it for? It's for the loser. The loser, losing candidate, we expect to give a concession speech to say, yes, I lost. I lost fair, fair and square. There's this great quote from the governor of Louisiana says, you know, the voters have spoken. Damn the voters. You know, something like that. <laughs> you know, uh, you know he's, he's, they're conceding, right? They know. I mean, you have problems with democracy if losing candidates don't concede. And you want the election to be convincing to everybody, including the loser or especially the user. The winner gets a mandate. The public knows that the elections are running well. Election officials can go, go home and sleep at night knowing they've, they've done their job. Right? But I think it, it's most important that the loser and the loser's supporters know that the election was tabulated properly. So how do, we, how do audits work? So here's the structure. You draw an initial sample, maybe a couple hundred ballots. You might have a, a state of millions of voters, but you can start off with a small sample. And in fact, the sample size depends really mostly on the margin of victory, what the percentage difference between the winner and the loser, as then on the number of ballots cast. It doesn't really depend on how many ballots were cast total. You look at those ballots by hand, following the voter intent rules for that state. And after you've looked at your sample, you can say, am I done? Have I, have I looked, do I have enough confidence in the outcome now? I have to apply some statistical thinking, some rule to say, a termination rule to say, am I done with the audit? If it is, you stop. If not, you enlarge your sample. You might double it in size or take 50% more or something like that. And you draw more ballots and look at them by the additional ballots by hand and then see if you're done. Right, so it's just an escalating procedure that keeps looking at more and more ballots until you've got confidence. And in the end, and particularly if the out reported outcome was wrong, uh, you may look at all of the ballots, which is what you'd expect with a full hand recount, if the initial reported outcome was wrong, you really should look at all the ballots, probably, just to make sure that the other candidate, who is the one that actually won, is confirmed as the winner. So these have, they start off small. They aim to be efficient using statistics. And that works well when the margin is, is reasonably large, not, not too tiny. Uh, but if the election is very, very close, or if it's a tie, or if the other candidate won, these things can escalate all the way to do a full hand recount. So these. Risk limiting audits are tabulation audits. There are lots of things they don't do, and it's important to keep that in mind when you think about security of elections. It doesn't tell you about the correctness of the tally. If the tally said it was 2 million and five votes to 1 million 539, you know, it doesn't confirm the numbers, it just confirms the outcome. Who was the winner? The winner. Right? It doesn't check on voter eligibility or voter authentication. It doesn't check on the usability or privacy of the system. It doesn't check that the chain of custody was properly maintained. That's other procedures that need to be there for the audit to work well, right? If you're going to audit the paper ballots, you have to make sure you're auditing the correct set of paper ballots. So you need to have a good chain of custody from the time the vote was cast to the time they were tabulated and then when they were audited. So the risk limiting audit is devoted to just the tabulation piece of this. So there's a couple of paradigms, and these are technically qualitatively different. Um, and affect the efficiency quite a bit. There's the ballot polling audits, which say, you know, I take a random ballot, I look at it, take another random ballot, look at it, and so on, and just try to look at the ballots freshly uh, and see, you know, who's winning in the sample, basically, uh, by how much. And the other kind of audit is the ballot comparison audit, where you pay attention to what the scanners thought of each ballot that you're looking at in the random sample. So you draw a random ballot ID, say ballot number 49, 
and you say, let's pick ballot 49, and let's compare that ballot to what the scanner said that that ballot said. That's a much more powerful statistical technique. It turns out you're measuring probabilities that are near zero because you're measuring error rates rather than measuring probabilities near a half if you've got a close election. So it's, it's much, you're, if you do any machine learning, you know that that's a much easier kind of problem. So ballot comparisons tend to be more efficient by a factor about one over the margin of victory. So if the margin of victory is about, say, 10%, you're about 10 times more efficient. You're looking at 10 times fewer ballots. So these are the ballot kinds of things that are favored. That's okay, it's working. There we go. This thing seems to be getting lightweight on the, okay, I'll fix it. All right, so, um, so those, those are the, uh, the two flavors. And we'll look a little bit at, at each of those. So the ballot polling audit, let's look at one of the flavors of that, the Bravo audit. So these are the kinds of audits that are, you'll s probably see uh, in play this coming year in, in November 2020, the number of states, because most states are not set up to do ballot comparison audits. You need to have numbers on the ballots put in by the scanners as they scan them so that you can go back and identify the matching electronic record with a paper ballot. Most, most machines are not set up to do that. So ballot polling tends to be the, the more popular kind. And the Bravo audit is one of the more popular ones. And it's easy to describe. So it's a risk limiting audit. You want to limit the risk of certifying the wrong outcome to something like, say, 5%. So you've got some given risk level that you're willing to tolerate, say, alpha equals 0 0.5, 0 0.05. And uh, you take the reported margin of victory as, as an input. So you've got some fraction of votes, say it's a two candidate race A and B, and you've got uh, a margin, uh, a vote share for A and a vote share for B. And what you do is you just pick the ballots at random. And if you see, a, uh, you have a running t uh, product of the following quantities. So you start off with one. And if you see a vote for A, you multiply that running product by two times A. So if A was the reported winner, you're multiplying by two times the reported share for A, which is over 50% because A was a reported winner. And so that you're multiplying by something bigger than one. And if B, you get a, see a ballot for B, you're multiplying by two times B, which will be something less than one. So this will tend to go up if you see votes for A and tend to go down if you see votes for B. And if it exceeds one over alpha, so if alpha is 0.05, one over alpha is 20, if you get up above 20, you stop and say, the audit's over. We've confirmed that A is one, okay? This is a martingale process. It has all kinds of nice properties. And, and uh, you can argue that the risk of certifying the wrong outcome is the most alpha here. Okay. Yeah? Yes, the, the, the vote shares, the reported vote shares for A and B. So A, Alice won with, say, 60%. So A here, the variable A represents 0.6, and B is 0.4. OK? So there's a, there's a typical ballot polling post-election statistical audit. These things are extremely efficient, assuming that the margin isn't too small. The, the, the number of ballots you have to look at goes down something like 1 over alpha squared, where alpha's, uh, sorry, 1 over the, the uh, margin of victory squared. So uh, if, if the margin is really tiny, you might have to look at all the ballots. But then you sort of have, you sort of expect that anyway, because if it's a very close race, you know, you, it, you know, a few ballots here or there making a difference could change the outcome of the election. So. Um, these have the right kind of statistical properties. So now let's talk about another part of this. How do you pick random ballots? So here's a fun part that we, we looked at recently. So it's an interesting question. I, I asked uh, you know, Percy Diaconis, who I think was here for a while, right? Uh, how, did, how, how would you pick a random ballot out of a box of ballots? He didn't know. You know and, and you ask other people, how do, you pick a random, how do you pick a random ballot? What's a good procedure for picking a random ballot out of a pile of paper ballots? So. Uh, the classic way is you know how many ballots are in your pile, um, and you count down to that. So you say you've got, you've got 901 ballots, I want ballot number 572. So you count down to ballot number 572 in the pile, where 572 was generated pseudo-randomly with a cryptographic random number generator, or say. Right. So that, that's um, pro one process. The other process, the new one, is this K-cut, where you'd make a, a cut of the deck of, like it's a deck of cards at a random level, and you do that, say, six times, and you get nice mixing properties, and you end up with taking the ballot on the top. Here's some videos of, of that. So here's, we, we tried this in Michigan with various things. So they tried both of these. 
So you want ballot number 572 out of uh, 901. So here's, this is uh, Mayuri, by the way, sitting on the side watching this. She's the one that did her master's thesis on this. Okay. You count down to 572. You can imagine what that's like, right? I mean, it's rather tedious. Two people there to watch. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But that, that's what the classical thing was. And the, the, you know, these technical details matter uh, if you're in the middle of it doing an audit. You have to, you know, that's all of the ballots that were scanned by one scanner during the day. Get 900 is a typical number. You know, 572 is a lot of random numbers. So. so here's the alternative that we proposed, K-cut. So you, have, you assume you have a, a, a random number generator, and you can do this in a number of ways. You can roll dice or something. Google provides a nice one on your smartphone if you just Google for random number generator. It gives you a little button. You can set the, the lower limit at 1 and the upper limit at 99, and just hit generate, and it'll give you a random number like 17. So we take that as how far down you should go into the, you know, eyeball it, just 17% down. So you generate a random number H, you go down about H percent of the way, and then you cut the, take that fraction off the top, put it on the bottom, and do that a few times. Okay, I'm going to switch pointers. So I've got a video here which shows that in operation. Computer scientists always have backups, right? So we've got a, we got a, got a backup, backup pointer here. Somewhere. Oh, you got one there too? Uh, I think I've got, I've got one here. I think I'm all set. All right, put that one out. Put that one. Sorry for the delay. There we go. So, repeat about six times. I think six can be cut to three with a little more analysis, but we did six, we know we can do. So, take the top ballot. So, here's that process for the same pile of ballots. Take a random number. Let's cut one out of six. Another random number. 20%, so they eyeball 20 or they eyeball that. So you can see the, the pile of ballots is being rotated by these random amounts every time. The distribution of what the ballot is on top approaches the uniform distribution very quickly and after six, six rolls. It's pretty close to uniform. My Aries thesis looks at the discrepancy closely and tries to get the, so I did three cuts there. She takes the top ballot off the top. Yeah, Melanie. How accurate So um, the analysis, yeah, so there's, there's a question as to whether, there's two questions. One is how accurate are people at picking a certain fraction? The other question is how people, accurate are people at picking random numbers. So this uses the, the calculator to p give you random numbers. The analysis we did presumed that people were making up random numbers in their head, which is even worse than the accuracy of doing, doing that. Um, so I think, I think we can probably get down to three cuts and get, get convergence quickly with, with, with that. How accurate are people? I can show you graphs. Uh, look at my Aries thesis. Uh, and it's got nice graphs. So you can sort of see the. So there, there's a way of picking random ballots. That's part of the audit. Okay, and those are just be some of the things that'll be used this fall. It's probably five times faster than the counting down, depending on the size of the things. Um, you may have to decrease the risk. Play, you know, it's not quite uniform, so you have to play games with the uniformity parameter and so on. And there's a Markov chain analysis that shows it converges quickly. It doesn't work for ballot comparison audits because it picks a random ballot. It doesn't find the ballot with a particular ID number on it, right? Which is what you need for ballot comparison audits. So. And there's the paper, an archive. Oh, sorry about this. Got some. That doesn't even show on this screen. Is it gone? What do I need to do? I can't see what I'm doing. Uh-oh. <laughs> Technical problems. 
Massachusetts Institute of Technology think I'd be better at technology, right? Are we back on? Is that on? No, that's not it. No internet. That's something else. I don't know why that's not working now. So I need to. There we go. All right. Auditing other outcome rules. So Eric Maskin last time gave a wonderful talk about preferential voting and why it's a good thing to use. And I agree with his recommendation. If you had voters voting with preferential rules so that you said, I prefer A first and then B and then C, you can ask the same question about auditing. How do, given a pile of ballots, how do I confirm that the tabulation of that pile of ballots gave the right result? Right? So you can have a preferential ballot. Voter says, I prefer A first, and C second, and D third, and B fourth, say with a four candidate race. And then there's some function that says, given a pile of such ballots, how do you determine who the winner is? One of the most popular ones these days is called instant runoff voting. I don't need to get into the details of that, but it's sort of an iterative procedure that looks to see if anybody's won in the first round choices. And if not, they eliminate a candidate and proceed. So. Uh, but it doesn't matter really what the rule is here. Uh, you have to have some process for doing this. And the approach I'd like to take is using what's called a black box out of things. Really, all you want to need for, for doing an audit is a black box that says, given a pile of ballots, who's the winner? And suppose I gave you an arbitrary voting rule and said, I'm going to give you a subroutine, a procedure that, given a pile of ballots, tells you who the winner is. If that's all I tell you about the, the auditing, the voting rule, can you audit the election? And there is an approach, a Bayesian approach, that I'll explain to you now, which allows you to do that. So they apply to any voting rule. So let me explain how Bayesian audits work. And this was used in Michigan in a pilot for a plurality election. So the voting rule wasn't complicated. It was just a yes or no on a proposition. But I'll, I'll explain the, the idea to you here. So we had an election. This is a, a, a real election that had 20, reported 22,999 votes yes on the proposition, 12,343 no votes reported for the election, a bunch of others, which are mostly invalid votes or scribbles or whatever. Um, and so that was the reported results. And then we took a sample of size 76 ballots and got 50 yes votes and 26 no votes. And you can say, well, what does that mean? Right, how do I interpret that? What, what's kind of the statistics I want to apply to this? Right. So let me explain one way of doing the statistics here, then, which is actually a way that applies to any kind of voting rule, not just plurality. Um, well, let me just first of all compare it with RLA. So the RLA standard rule says, what's the risk if I were to stop the audit now and terminate and accept the report outcome? What's the chance that I would accept you know, if the income outcome was incorrect, what's the chance that I would actually approve it at that point? That's a different question than what the Bayesian would say. The Bayesian would say, oh, sorry. Is it, going? Is it back? OK. Bayesian would say, what's the probability that if all of the ballots were looked at, that the reported winner would win or lose. Right? So the upset probability would be the probability that the reported winner would lose if we looked at all the ballots. That's a subtly different question. It sort of presupposes a model of what the cast ballots are like. Right? It's not conditioning. A, a, the RLA is a con conditional probability statement. This is sort of a, a probability model thing. You have to have a model for the ballots based on what you've seen so far. So let's see how that might work. So we start by drawing a sample of ballots. You know, a couple hundred of them, maybe, 76. Uh, and now we want to imagine looking at all of the ballots. The Bayesian rule said, you know, what are the chances that if you looked at all the ballots, you would have an upset? So let's imagine that we're looking at all the ballots, but I'm not going to actually look at all the ballots now because I've got a sample and that's all I'm allowed to look at for now. And, and when I start looking at the other ballots, I will simulate looking at a real ballot by looking at a previously examined ballot. OK, so we simulate that. We find the winner for that 
run, we expand all of them. I'll give an example here. Um, and then we just do that many times and find the percentage of times that the reported winner doesn't win. And that's the upset probability. So if we repeat with a larger sample, if the fraction is bigger than 5%, so we draw a bigger sample. So there's a double loop here. One is on the sample size, and the other one is on the number of simulation trials you run for a given sample. Here for the Michigan data, we had a sample of size 76. We want to know what's the probability if we had looked at all the ballots that the reported winner, that's yes, would have won or lost. So we can draw, imagine picking ballots at random, but not really looking at them. We were building a model is what we would see if we looked at them by looking at ballots that are to the left on this list here. So we just repeat the ballot. This is a polius urn kind of thing, if you're familiar with that. So we draw uh, a ballot from those that we've already looked at and re replicate it. We do this over and over again. So I'm just repeating ballots that are to the left until I fill out the entire line. Now I've got a simulated draw of all of the ballots. And I can see who won. And I can tally that. And I can do the whole thing over and over again, because computers are fast. And I can say, what's the probability that the reported winner will lose if I do this many times? And if that's too high, the upset probability is reported, sorry, the reported winner lost if I do this many times. If that's too high, then the upset probability is too high, and I can draw a larger sample. So we did this in the Michigan data. Uh, the RLA was done by Kelly Adebani, who was a graduate student at Berkeley working with Philip Stark. She measured the risk measurement at 2.1% there for the sample of size 76. With our Bayesian approach, we had a measure of 99.7% of the time, yes, one as well. So they both got the same result. They both confirmed the reported outcome. These, these methods are, tend to give very similar results, but they use different mathematics. And the Bayesian audit, in many ways, is much more flexible because it's a black box audit. It allows you to work with any kind of voting system whatsoever. So this, these are research directions that we're still looking at, understanding the relationship between Bayesian audits and risk-limiting audits. Risk-limiting audits um, have a better uh, PR game at the moment. They're much more popular, and they're the right thing to use in practice for most elections these days because they're mostly just propositions or, or single winner candidate things. But if you get to more complicated situations, uh, Bayesian audits are, are uh, you know, a promising way to, to go, and we're still exploring that. So they extend to ballot comparison audits, hybrid audits where you've got some counties using equipment that uses, has cast vote records, others that don't, uh, uses complex voting systems, as I said, and there's details in the, in the paper here. Yeah, question, sure. Yes, yeah, so in the case of a yes-no thing, it's just a dearest lay distribution that you're, you're, you're simulating with a pull you kind of thing. So yes, you can get the closed form expression for that. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing uh, a complex voting scheme like IRV or something like that, then I don't know how to do the math for, for the complicated things. But for, for a yes-no proposition, you're absolutely right. And this is classic statistics. You're getting you know, the, the equivalence between the closeness between a pull you model, which is what this is, and, and a Dirichlet distribution is what So they're, they're not doing the simulations. So, so in, the, in the Bayesian thing, you sort of have to do the simulations to get the estimates of the probability. The, the uh, RLAs have nice, the math is simpler. You have, you have uh, sort of martingale theorems that say that if you just take the rule as given, then you know, if the, um, the, the, in the Bravo case, if the accumulated product ever drops, goes above one over alpha, then you can stop. And the, the chances of your making, a, if, if the outcome is wrong, the chances of your accepting it as, nonetheless is the most alpha. So. so so the math can be more or less complicated. But computers are fast these days, so something like a Bayesian approach with simulation loop inside is perfectly doable. Um, there is a question with any of this technology, um, and it's important for democracy, about explaining it to people that want to do it. If you've got the, a losing candidate uh, who's uh, lost the election, you're saying, you know, it, well, or the other guy won or something, you know, you, you want to, um, make it comprehensible to the losing candidate, to the pop poppies at large, and so on. So this kind of technology, using statistics and so on, too, has an issue, as does the cryptographic techniques I'll talk about in a second, too. So any of this stuff is, is uh, challenging to implement be in practice, because you want to make sure all of the technology that's being used in our, our elections 
is as comprehensible and transparent as possible. And so you need some technical background to understand some of this. And that, that is a definite issue. I mentioned cryptographic voting, so I've got two more pieces to this talk. I don't know how I'm doing in time with the delays with the technology. Oh, we're doing okay. So um, and then verifiable voting, which is a cryptographically based voting scheme. So it's possible to approach integrity of elections using cryptography instead of using, say, statistics and post-election audit. So this is a talk about that. And it's another theme in the development of secure elections. Um, but it's based on, as I said, different uh, methodology, trying to use cryptography to provide the confidence that you need. And it provides a better guarantee in some ways than the statistics does, as you'll see. And then I'll talk at the end a little bit about internet voting. So end-to-end -end verifiable voting is a theme that uh, started with David Chaum way back in, in the uh, 80s and has been developed slowly over time since. Um, really, there's three parts to an election, right? You, the vote should be cast as intended. So the voters should have confidence that the vote they cast is what they wanted. They should be collected as cast. So there's a, that's sort of the chain of custody issue. They, they, when the votes are tallied, they're usually collected together and then counted somehow. And then counted as collected, so they have to be counted properly. So if you put those three together, they're, they're you know, counted as cast, essentially, which is what you want. So paper ballots only provide the first property. The voter can verify that the ballot is rep an accurate representation of what their intended desire is, what their intended vote is. But paper ballots don't automatically provide ways of telling that the votes aren't tossed in the river. Um, you, know, you have to have some process there to, for people to watch the ballots to make sure that they're not they're collected as, as cast. That they're, uh, and then the counting process has to be uh, done. And that's what we talked about with some of these auditing techniques, the RLAs. So all three of those have to be worked. And end-to-end -end verifiable uses a bit of cryptography to enforce all of these things. So, and it's a new thing. One of the nice things about RLAs and such is that you don't really need to change how people vote. End-to-end uh, -end verifiable voting does change the voting experience a bit. One of the things that's new is that you have a public bulletin board as part of the election now. So a website somewhere that posts the election parameters, who the candidates are, the date of the election, the usual stuff. Uh, and then for each voter, post their vote in encrypted form. So we have here Abe, so the, na the name of the voter, and the vote of Abe encrypted. So the, some cryptography is used to encrypt each vote so that Abe can't sell his vote. He can't prove to anybody else how he voted. This is a public key encryption with the public key of the election officials, say, and Ben and so on too. So your vote will appear there, and there's a reported winner, and then there's a proof that it's correct. So uh, that's a, one, the first change in these end-to-end -end verifiable voting schemes is that the, there's this public bulletin board as part of it. So that provides an additional way for the voters to verify that the vote is correctly tallied so it provides evidence that the reported winner is correct. You can use a blockchain for this if you like to. I don't really like blockchain voting, but uh, this, is, this is a reliable database, append only. And the votes are encrypted. So there's a couple of challenges with that. So Abe, ha or she, I got the voters feminine here, so maybe it's Abigail or something. Um, she can verify, she has to verify that the encryption was done properly. So there's a challenge there with this technology saying the vote has to be encrypted to be posted, but the voter has to be confident that it really does encrypt her vote. And there's a cute protocol due to Josh Benlow that I don't really have time for here that allows the voter to sort of uh, give confidence that that encryption was done properly. So the voter gets a copy of the encrypted ballot and then can look up on the public bulletin board that that's correct. So she can see that her ballot is there. She has confidence it's right. She's got a piece of paper she can take home. It's a receipt saying, here's the encrypted version of your vote. Um, and she can't use that receipt to sell her vote. That's very important. She can confirm effectively the chain of custody so that she, the uh, fact that the vote is out there on the, on the website is a chain of custody point. So um, collected as cast. 
is, is, is automatic with this uh, database. And if it's not there, she can uh, protest and say, you know, my vote didn't appear. You can't do that with a paper ballot. Once you've cast your paper ballot, if it doesn't get counted, if it gets dropped on the floor somewhere, you know, you don't have any recourse. You're trusting the process and the election officials to make sure all the ballots are collected properly. Here, you can actually look at your own ballot and say, did my ballot make it into the counting? And then the tally can be verified with some cute mathematics. There are various forms of encryption one can use. Some of them have properties that are useful exactly in situations like this. Uh, so these properties might, for example, be homomorphic in the sort that says if you take the product of two ballots, uh, you get the, so there are encryptions of a tally for Alice, say, and another encryption for a tally for Alice. You get the encryption of their sum. So by multiplying these ballots together, you get a, a super ballot, which is the sum of all the, the votes for the candidates. So the math gives you uh, a nice way of combining all the ballots and, to enable tallying without having to decrypt any particular individual's ballot. And you end up with this one super ballot that's encrypted, and you decrypt that and, and demonstrate that as, as the uh, gives the final result. And you have to prove that that's correct. Question. So that was the, the Josh Benelow thing, right? So um, I'll describe it to you quickly then. So you got this machine. You've typed in your choices to the machine. The machine spits out a piece of paper, which allegedly is the encryption of the plain text of your votes. Why should you believe that that encryption was done properly? Maybe the machine is lying to you and encrypting somebody else's vote. So these encryptions are randomized and the, once you know the randomization factor, the public key is also public, so it's, it's the election officials thing. Once you know the randomization factor, you can check the encryption. So you have an option when you're given this piece of paper saying, yes, I want to cast that, and I'll trust that it's okay, or I want to check that this encryption was done properly. Please give me the randomization factor that was done for the encryption. Once you've got that, you can do the en encryption yourself, check that it was done properly, but then you can't cast that ballot because you know you'd be able to sell your vote. So you have to go back and start over. Okay, so that's, that's the brief version of the, the Benelow protocol. So it uses homomorphic encryption for the tallying. So in summary, I mean, the, the, the point is you, you, you're encrypting your ballots. You're posting the encryption forms on, on this website. You can use that to check that all, everything's OK. And it gives you much stronger properties than you can with just a statistical audit of the paper ballots. So this has been used in practice. Um, Scantegrity in Tacoma Park used it a couple of elections. Well, we were, I was part of the team that did that. Wombat in Israel, Fred Avote in New South Wales, Star Vote in Austin, Texas was designed but never built because they didn't get the funding. Election Guard now has just been announced recently out of Microsoft, which is going to be providing support for, um, uh, for, for this technology. So it's a technology which is coming. I think, you know, give it a, a decade or so, it'll, some trials, it'll, it'll be. Uh, uh, you know, probably widely used, but we'll see. It's, it's got complexity. The issue is a lot of these things is complexity, understanding the technology, making sure people understand what's, what's going on. So you, you actually combine them, you can have paper and these, you use the RLAs together with the end-to-end -end thing. So that's what the uh, Scantegrity scheme did. Recommendation number... 5.11 of our National Academy report. It's just worth saying, no internet voting. Question, yes? Yeah. We found it was, yeah. Uh, technically, there may not be a lot of advantage, uh, but if the cryptography should break, um, I think the most useful point of this was in, in, when we were working with this integrity scheme in Tacoma Park, the election officials who had to approve it could sleep at night because they knew that they had paper ballots. They could count if, if all the, the math and the cryptography and something somehow broke overnight and didn't work. You know, they knew that they had the paper ballots there that they could work with, right? So it gives a, a sense of comfort to people who don't understand the cryptography but want to feel comfortable with the paper. That do feel comfortable with the paper ballots, right? So there's that point, which I think is a strong one actually.
So the cryptographer gives you the chain of custody check, right? So you can see that your ballot made it all the way to the tally. Paper ballots don't give you that per se. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions on that before I move on to this? I mean, maybe this point doesn't need to be belabored much. This is a technical audience here. You, 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 most of your computer scientists, you understand uh, the, the problems with the internet. You read the papers and the, the problems with software. Um, but it keeps coming up all the time. There is even this wonderful website called http colon slash slash vote in your pajamas .com, right? Which uh, is exactly that, right? You want to be able to vote uh, from, from home. And people say, oh, I want to fix the voting problem. Let's all vote from our smartphones or, or whatever, you know? And, you know so I, I just don't think we're there yet, right? I, mean, I think it's maybe someday, but the internet and software have such complexity and such fragility that you know, trying to run like democracy on the basis of trust in what's happening on your smartphone or trust of what's happening on the internet, I, I just don't think it's, it's a, a wise decision, particularly nowadays given the alleged and probably true you know, attempts by various nation states to interfere with our elections. So there's a report that came out a few years ago in 2015 that I was one of the co-authors on talking about internet voting. I said, you know, maybe someday, but if you're going to do it, you really need to do it with end-end -end verifiable voting, the technology we just talked about. But before you do that, you need to have understood how it works in the real world with paper ballots even. And it's anyway not sufficient to give you a secure system because it doesn't solve a lot of the problems that you have with internet voting, such as just various kinds of malware, denial of service attacks, voter authentication, and so on too. So there's a lot of problems with, you know, you, see, you read the papers, you just see the problems that we have with uh, people losing secrets and, and uh, you know, trying to run a, a um, internet service all the time. So it, it, it's asking for a, a boatload of trouble, and I don't think we need to do that. Keeping, keeping things simple is, is uh, much preferred. But someday we may, we may have internet voting. We may get to the point where we feel confident that we can trust these systems. I think we're a couple of decades at least away from that time. So... I think we can make conclusions. We can make elections a lot more secure with post-election audits, paper ballots, and, and maybe some cryptography. Um, Long-term, end of verifiable voting is probably the way to go. We have to get some more experience with it. Hybrid methods uh, with both things. And we're not ready for internet voting yet, and maybe not for another 20 years. So that's sort of where I see where we are with elections. Um, things are getting better. There's more audits happening every day. Uh, you saw the op-ed come out on the Washington Post uh, recommending RLAs. Hopefully we'll see all the swing states with RLAs coming up next November. Uh, that would be great. I don't know if we'll get there or not. So I'd be happy to take questions. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Salil. Yes, yes, so you know, what about coercion for, for remote voting? So um, I tend to view security problems for voting in two flavors. Uh, first of all, voting is over-constrained. There's no perfect solution. You're going to have some problems, and some of them may be of the coercion, coercion nature. Um, for, for, um, coercion, there's, for, for security problems, there's two flavors. There's the retail flavor, where you're, the adversary is tweaking votes one by one, and that's what Vote my mail has that problem, for example. You know, spouse can coerce you, your boss might coerce you. That's an admitted problem, um, but it's not one that's maybe unlivable. Um, you know, you could say, uh, I'm willing to tolerate the convenience of vote by mail in return for, for retail fraud of that sort. Where you have real problems are massive things where you can change the, the machine that's doing the tallying, change the whole tally uh, with one attack. And so like it's a wholesale fraud of that sort. So I, I think I, I would distinguish between those two and say that there may be you, know, you, can't, you can't be totally comfortable with any of these schemes because they all have problems. But internet voting um, is typically a form of remote voting where the, the fraud that you see will be retail fraud. I mean, it may be the case that you can take over a router and change what happens in an entire city if the protocols aren't well designed. And that would be a form of wholesale fraud. That would be a disaster. So, yeah. Yes, if you're using end-end voting, you can check your vote. Yeah, yeah, then you're okay. 
Yeah. But there are protocols, internet voting protocols, which don't have that flavor. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so this is a matter of election law, the order of the candidates there. Um, I wrote a little note on this once. I think it's an interesting question as to how much it matters. So my proposal, and this is done only half tongue in cheek, is that the candidates should be allowed to bid on their position on, on, the, on the ballot, right? And the, the, the currency that they pay is not money, but votes. So I say, I'm, I'm willing to give up 200 votes if I can be first, you know? So. Nobody's taking that up. I don't know. <laughs> Other questions? Are there? Well, the, the usual requirements apply. You need to be able to provide a reliable channel for the voter to authenticate themselves and, and have confidence that the, the, the vote was, was there. And, and uh, you know, you're trusting, usually with remote voting schemes, internet voting schemes, you're trusting the uh, machine to be your agent. So the machine is acting as you. You can't do the encryption. You, you can't communicate on the internet directly. So you trust the machine. So the, the issue is you have to be very clear about what are you trusting it for. You're trusting it for privacy typically too. So you have to have some confidence the machine's not just broadcasting your vote out to to the world somehow as, you, as you're placing the, the ballot. So um, there wasn't a design that anybody on the team said, yeah, we're, we're comfortable with that design. I, I think it's a, there's a lot of unsolved problems. And most of them have to do with reliability of the internet. I mean, you have a DDoS attack. You can shut down Chicago just by shutting off all the routers in Chicago with a DDoS attack. And, and so people in Chicago don't get to vote. That doesn't seem right. Question, yeah. Yes. So th those are unsolved questions. I mean, it, voting authentication is a matter not only of technical ability and so on too, but also politics. Uh, for example, my son, when he first voted here in Massachusetts, he went to the polls and he was very surprised that he didn't have to show any identification. He said, you yeah, know, my name is Alex Rivest. I live at this address. You know, and they said, okay, here's your ballot. You know, he said, you know, what, happened? what is this? You know, no authentication whatsoever. And that was a political decision based on, on Massachusetts. I mean, other states have voter ID rules that are much more stringent. You can say yeah, there's a trade-off between you know, making voting easy, easy to use and accessible versus you know, putting up barriers to people. And the political decision in Massachusetts was not to make it so hard. So it's not only technical, it's also political as to how, where you want to draw the line. Um, and there are lots of choices you could have for internet voting. And, and, the kind of relationship that citizens have with their government. You know, if you put chips in your hands or something like this too, you know, maybe you can get some high level of confidence, but that's not the kind of situation you want to have with your with the government, maybe, right? You know, so I don't know the right answer. Good question. Yeah. The only experience I have with a caster challenge in, in, in uh, practice is um, with Scantegrity, uh, and people there tended not to challenge. So it was, a, yeah. I think there's a real question there as to whether people would challenge it often enough. Yeah, good question. 